ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the first session. Please welcome the panelists for a discussion on defining community and collective impact. This panel will be moderated by Fred Wellman. Joining Fred, Kelly Lamb, Jeff Lorraine, Jim McDonough, and Carrie H. McDonough. And, and are receiving services and, and for us 
depending on where you define a community is the amount of resources that they have. And this is sort of the, the, the build up. So if I'm, if I'm in a company or if I'm in a school, I have a certain, I have resources and they're limited. Then I have to reach to the, my next level. And then that's another community. And then I have to reach my le next level. That's another community. And then I have to reach my next level. And that's a community. Sort of a, each one until you get to a point where the services are provided. Uh, Car? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm glad we're highlighting this because we sure throw around the word community a ton in this space. And I think to step back, I find that there's two main ways we use the word community. One is to address a group of people that live in a similar area or place, right? And the second is to address a group of people that get support from one another and have, they have something in common with, right? And in our modern day life, those two communities can be very different, right? Your, your people you get support from may not be your neighbors. And we think that's a missed opportunity. So at Best Community Connections, what we're trying to do is bring those two communities together, finding more ways that we can have our veterans get knowledge and expertise from community members that live in that area, um, and for our community members that live in that area that may or may not be veterans to learn about the talents that veterans bring to their community. Houston. All right, so uh, at Combined Arms, we really break it down into the three stakeholder groups. So we look at the first stakeholders, which is our group of active duty veterans, regards, uh, sorry, uh, reservist guard members, uh, families, caregivers, in one group. Uh, second group is our um, is really our sort of member organizations, uh, and then our third group is the community, right? And that's what we refer to our our foundations, our donors, um, our government. Um, universities or institutions. Um, All together, really, um, we had to focus on providing a value proposition to all three stakeholder groups in the community, so in order to make this whole process work. So that's how we define the community at Combined Powers. Whatever way, it's not like it. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the things I hear a lot, as I, and, and I, I attend a lot of these conferences in my work, is um, what's my amazing, especially at the local level, is that a lot of organizations that do a lot of stuff with veterans, don't have veteran anywhere in their name. Yeah. And Carr, I think you and I discussed it, you know, <clears throat> when you talk about that, what is, how, do you, how do you define the collective aid? What is the collective aid in a larger community? How is that in that larger community defined in a larger community? How would you guys address that, that larger community of the collective aid? So, um, yeah, I think we're, there's two big parts of collective impact that I find enticing. First of all, I'll step back and say I was weary of this term for a while. Um, I am a former management consultant, so when you hear terms like this that promise to be the be-all, end-all, I, I kind of get nervous. <laughs> but I think that at the core of collective impact is something that we all understand and can relate to. And that's that complex change requires a whole bunch of stakeholders to come together to help solve, right? And the other part is that you need to do it at the local level. Why? Because you need to build on what already exists in a community. Um, otherwise, it's wasted effort. And so when we set out to build Best Community Connections, we first brought together a whole group of people at that community that had never been together before. Uh, we had local government, so all sectors, local government, we uh, county mayors, we had uh, nonprofit community, and not just nonprofits that focus on veterans <coughs> exclusively. Uh, we had our business community, and we had veterans. And I, I, just for one anecdote on that, after our first meeting um, in San Diego, this woman came up to us and said, you know, I, I'm in the school district, and uh, I thought it was a mistake that I was invited to this meeting. I'd never been invited to a veteran meeting. Um, but now I see that, you know, we don't serve veterans, but I see the role that we can play in, in supporting this initiative. So I think that's big, the core part of collective impact is you bring a bunch of sectors together. If you focus in one sector, it's not collective impact. Um, and then real quickly, I just think you have to build up what already exists. And, and so for us, that was building on uh, that wasn't decided, that was decided by our community. If yeah. the community knows best what already exists there. For us, it was a uh, two-on-one infrastructure, two-on-one call center. Um, but again, that's a core thing, is it has to be dependent on that community. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Now, 
that, just um, echoing a little bit of what Carr is talking about, is, to me it all comes down to a, a shared responsibility and a shared consciousness. Like that. That's what I think this is actually all about. All, all the fancy words you know, that go into this stuff, I, I don't think are that important. I think what is important is creating a sense and, a, and an understanding of a shared responsibility in the community to address the needs of human beings. And I didn't use the word better than any of that. And, and I think what, what you find is not a lack of capacity or a willingness, but just the inability to go to that next step to share in the responsibility collectively to serve people best. And, and it's natural. I, I recognize that it's natural uh, to compete. You know, that's just what this is. This is what the world is made of. But when you can break through that barrier and create just a little bit of shared responsibility and consciousness over serving human beings, and I think what our sector represents is a leading way, an exemplary way to kind of address the pervasive needs of, of Americans in general. And the idea being that a community that shares their responsibility to serve people best, um, if it happens to be a military connected community or not, is probably serving people best. And, and if you can break through that barrier, uh, it's special. Like, and it's, it's hard. I think we all would admit it's the hardest of the hard things that we've done in our lives and are trying to do. It's really hard. Uh, and, and it's difficult to achieve, but you're seeing the pieces of it where I think people are frustrated, which is an inability to share responsibility. And the things that Linda talked about, about data, technology, and tools, certainly empower a bit more of that today. But at the end of the day, it's people. And, and whether or not they're willing to move beyond their own personal boundaries and, and create openness and access in new ways and, and demonstrating that it works is really what this is about. Yeah, you know, our, our, for us, uh, our model is, is a really a relationship-based model. It's, it's uh, knowing the person face-to-face -face and knowing the person at, at, a, at, a, at a personal level. You have four steps, connect, educate, advocate, collaborate. But there's two sides to each of those words. There's the community side and the veteran side. And so our model, our approach is to connect to the veteran, to get to know who they are on an individual level, to connect to the community. And, and to your point, you know, there's 400,000 serving community, serving organizations in the nation, like high level serving organizations in the nation, 400,000 that aren't just focused on veterans. They're focused on housing, education, employment, uh, hunger, they all serve veterans. That's a beautiful thing. Except but, the population, they're going right. to end somehow. Yeah, yeah, they are. And, and you know, if uh, we were talking about uh, you know diversity within a workforce, and, and I said the most diverse subpopulation within a workforce is usually the veterans. If you want to get diversity, find the vets, because they're the most diverse. So, so it's connect, connect to the connect to the uh, veteran, connect to the community, because the resources are there. I think the, the, the partners that we have, the affiliates that we have, would tell you that 90% of solutions can be found in the community. It's, it's in the veteran world, the tough part is, the federal government has such a role to play, it's getting, that's the other 10%, it's getting that connected. So it's connect, educate, educate the community about the value of the vets and, and how they bring back to the community, educate the veteran about opportunities. Edu advocate for the community. There's not a community I've ever met that didn't say, I want to be the best community in the United States. We're going to be the best city in the United States. And, and it's like, go for it. Do it. Right? Um, <coughs> advocate for the veteran. Help them navigate these resources that they otherwise would never go to. And then collaborate is collaborate with everybody locally and collaborate internally and externally. And I think I think the point there is, is that there are there are more than enough resources. And, and all of our programs serve to be experts on where those resources are. And so connectivity is how do I take you as a need and connect you with you as a means? Yeah, so, yeah, so just to add on top of what uh, Jim said, um, you know, at the heart of collective impact is creating a system, right? And uh, why do we create a system? Um, and, and why do we need to do collective impact? It's really to improve the service delivery to veterans. That's why we're all here. Right, over this conference, um, you know, creating a system by nature, by working together in that system, you're going to improve uh, efficiencies by working together, and also reduce the redundancies 
and there would be a highlight where maybe there's too much supply and there's no demand, right? And so you'll start to hone in on the best machine. Um, and all of that kind of works towards uh, identifying, I guess, creating uh, the best environment to serve veterans. So um, really, kind of getting back to the original question, you know, uh, you know collective impact is important because it, it improves the service delivery of, of veterans, or two veterans. I, I, can I just, I, I, don't, I don't agree. No. And so, so no, <laughs> all right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's not that a system is the means to the end, and I think for us, the, the end is improve the quality of life of veterans and their families, right? And, and the system is a way to get there, but it's not the there, right? And, and um, the system is the way you identify the resources, but for us, the goal is if I can improve the quality of life for veterans, again, going back to the diversity of the veteran population, I'm actually improving the quality of life of, of the community. And, and you see the community start to raise up. You see their hope level come up. And I, 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 I think we're sort of saying the same thing, but our focus is not on, it's not let's build a really good system because you can have an awesome system and it doesn't change anything. I, I think if your goal is I want to change, I want to change and improve the quality of life of people again, I'll go back to our approach, that America's where partnership focus is a relationship focus. And Jim calls it down and in. And, 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 and the down and in for us is, is how to get down and in and meet the veteran at their level where they are. And in order to do that, I need a good system. But that's the goal. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, Kelly, Kelly gets the last word. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll let him watch the clock. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'll say that, um, you know, it, it, a system is a framework, right? It's just a framework from which we operate and do these things better, right? So, um, you know, uh, you know that, that's why I mentioned stakeholders before, is because we manage these stakeholders, and we're managing the relationships with the stakeholders. Um, without the relationships, you can't have the system. So I, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so this gets to a point, I, I, the, the point of this, we want to actually teach some folks and learn from our lessons. I don't want to paint a picture of everything's all sunshine and roses everywhere, because we know that ain't it at all, right? I mean, folks who work in this you know, area know. So let's just, you know, what, maybe you each of you, I mean, you've all got various input. What's like the major barrier you found success in your, in your efforts? And um, let's just go left and right. Changing behavior. Changing behavior. Just so hard to do. So in what sense? Well, you know, we're all trying to innovate, and I kind of agree, not to speak you, but Kelly's point, <laughs> I think, is true. I think <laughs> Kelly, I, but I think Kelly's point is um, you can focus on the on the end consumer, the veteran, but it can be very inefficient and ineffective journey to get there if you're not careful. And I think that's where the combination of the And I think Sam talked about that in yeah. article, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. We really have to change the behavior and organization. It's yeah. no longer just me, me, me. It's, it's about a collective. Yeah. And that's very uncomfortable for us in the nonprofit. Right. 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 When I first started doing this work, I didn't even recognize that what would be necessary would be the change in behavior. I just believe everybody got this. Right. Like, hey, it makes sense, man. Yeah. Why, can't we, why can't we coordinate solutions across this country? For you might take one of my dollars that I should have. That's, what, that's where it gets hard. And, and so what, what I underestimated was the degree of difficulty in changing behavior across communities. You can do it in one community try to do it at scale. And so what I underestimated was the degree of difficulty in changing provider behavior from focusing on me, 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 right. how I get it done for you, 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 to being a part of it. To being part of a team that, that values what people do best to serve someone's needs. And so I, I underestimated that. That to me was a wake up call. And then the scale. Like if you really wanna if you really want to change the world, it requires us to work at scale. Because the, the sailor in San Diego and his family moving to Norfolk, Virginia with a, a child with exceptional needs is going to start their journey to serve that child's needs all over again in, in Norfolk, Virginia when they make a permanent change of station move. And I find that unacceptable. And, and I think if we're going to work smartly, we've got to do this at scale. I, I underestimate changing behavior and just the scale factor is really difficult. All right, cut off two. Yeah. Tim Ray. 
Yeah, so um, we joke, we've got a lot of scar tissue. And, and to Jim's point, I, I agree. You know, for us, finding, changing behavior was was really tough. And, and I think if there's a behavior that that is an enormous obstacle, it's ego. And and you, you work with nonprofits, whether they're the community lead or the community backbone, or whether they're a service provider, and they do great stuff. But because they've done their thing, and it's their thing, and it's what they do, they won't bend a little bit to fit within the overall, or they won't work together. They won't, they won't participate because it takes a share away from them that, that for the greater good would serve the community, but they don't want to give that little share up. And you go, oh, come on, this is not, you know, when we started, to Jim's point, I thought, this isn't rocket science. This just makes sense. And, and then when we went out to do it, to go to scale, it, it was, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't get this? What do you mean there's obstacles? This is the easiest thing we can do. Why can't we do it? And, and, and I think for us, it's finding a good leader within the community. I think you have the same thing. You have to look to find a good leader in the community. And, and Houston's uh, blessed to have Kelly and, and your team at Combined Arts to have a good leader in the community. So, and that's the big thing is, is that if we can just put our egos aside and say, okay, I get the bigger picture and how I can fit into it, and I may have to give up a little bit here to get the greater good, I'm willing to do that. I think we find that my community, it's a um, big fish in a little pond thing. Yeah. <laughs> right? I've been a big fish in a little pond for a long time. When you do collective impact or a community creation model, it's, it's, it makes you a smaller fish perceptually. Kari? I, I would say yes and yes to those two. Um, you mentioned five things that describe collective impact when you started, right? So we had a you know, common agenda and shared yep. metrics and collaboration and backbone. Uh, yeah, the easiest of those sounds like it's the common agenda. And for us, we have been surprised at how often we have to go back to that and remind people, here's our mission, here's what it is. And just as importantly, here's what it isn't, right? Like, you know, people in between the different groups come to the table and they've got it slightly different. So we have to always start reiterating, you know, uh, at every meeting, at every forum, here's, let's make sure we agree on our common agenda. Here's what we're trying to tackle. Yeah, I agree with every single one of these. Um, All right, that's easy. But, yeah, easy. So, however, but on top of that, uh, <laughs> On top of that, uh, so Houston, the Greater Houston area covers an area about the size of Connecticut, right? It's huge, 6.3 million people. Um, I completely underestimated the cultural differences in that area, right? You think cultural, cultural, I mean, I don't like urban, rural, suburban, or rural, um, you know, uh, Christian, you know, it yeah. all of it. It's a very, it's a melting pot town as well. Absolutely, and so you look at the, the veterans that reside in, in rural versus veterans that, design, that reside in, in, in uh, suburban, and then the ones that, that reside in the urban areas. There's a vast difference in needs and culture. Um, so uh, that was one thing. And the, the second thing really kind of, kind of is a little bit like what your card was talking about. So it's the, the, the narrative, right? So um, the people that we interface with have, have to hear uh, the Veterans as an asset narrative at least three times before they pick it up. Right. Um, I think the, the prevalence of the, uh, the, the broken veteran narrative uh, is super strong. And uh, you know, so we have to continually you know, try to beat down that door. Do you think that we as leaders of these organizations, um, to, to pivot off of that, is, are, do we inadvertently perpetuate that problem in our efforts, do you think? Do you think some of our organizations perpetuate the veterans as a, a needed as a positive? So I think it really gets back to what uh, Jim Young said before about changing behavior. Right. So um, it, you know, it's if you're on cruise control and it's been it's been what's worked for a long time. And, it, and, and well, which let's, be, let's be honest. Won't you help a veteran today? Let, let's, <laughs> let, let's be honest. In many cases, it does work. Yeah. Uh, but it's low hanging fruit. You know, let's let's get away from the low hanging fruit. And, Well, we saw, you know, we do, a, we do an annual survey every year, and uh, this year 
consistent with the previous, 85% of the veterans that we surveyed were good to go. They, they, they were, they were, uh, they weren't seeking needs. They were, they're number one. So the, the three, the top three things of the veterans population that we served, uh, seeking an opportunity to volunteer, seeking an opportunity to network with other veterans, find a purpose. Those three things, not housing, not employment, not, not hunger, it was those things, because 85% of them, again, the approach is it's the personal individual. For us, it's proactive outreach and engagement, meet the veteran where they are and get to know all veterans. Well, when you meet all veterans, the vast, vast majority of us are doing okay. You know, we can use something here and something there, but it's nothing that's catastrophic. And, and I think, I think to Kelly's point is that, that there's a narrative there, and, 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 and I just want to make one other statement that, that um, uh, you know, the, the landmark event that WWP went through changed all of us for one reason, and, and it's a big reason. Um, somebody said, Duvet told me, and, and it's not just one person, since many, and Mike Lennington's here, but met, somebody said to me a week ago, do you guys not have as many issues because I never see WWP out there, and is, are, are we not in Afghanistan or Iraq anymore? because there's no more Wounded Warrior Project commercials out there. You were the way, my WWP was the way that was keeping it front of mind for the vet, for the American people that there were people serving on their behalf. And, and so, but anyways, I, so I think on a national level, I think, it, yeah, it's, we're not disabled. We're strong, but we're still engaged, we're still out there, and we still have, you know, we 1% serves for the 99%, and you know what? They're in the community. The rest of the community can help serve that 1%. I'd like to think we're all very consciously trying to find that middle ground. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that's, if that was easy, it would be. Yeah. Right, and, yeah. it is. Uh, it, and I, I think we all represent a group, a collective, that is trying to ensure that the, the narrative stays somewhere in the middle. I think we're all conscious of that. I think none of us tilt one way or the other, um, and I think we're all trying to find that middle ground where um, the most of us are in terms of what we do for a living and for the people we serve. So I think I think it's a conscious effort underway to, to strike that middle ground tone, and I think we're starting to see that more and more. Well, I think we, like, we talk about a lot that the local battle is it, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. while we saw homelessness is down, unemployment's yeah. down, that's great that we call it the big national hand wave, right? The big national organization is like, look, <laughs> but we all know, especially the serve in the military, this is great, but it's my unit crossing that line that matters. And, and now, today, it was what I love about community impact and, and the local models is it's, the fight's still the local level, right? I mean, you're, it, it still comes down to one veteran who unfortunately has ended up in social services, possibly losing his children, for X. So all my national hand-waving, it's still that local organization that's got to solve that issue. Okay. So uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So about a year ago, um, Houston was hit by Hurricane Harvey, right? And uh, saw unprecedented amounts of rainfall and flooding, right? Um, and, uh, you know, these, some of these so called, you know, down on your luck veterans um, were uh, some of our best assets uh, during Hurricane Harvey. Yep. One, one story was uh, there was a, a, a young woman with, with Team Rubicon who was a homeless female veteran. And um, she found purpose and meaning by coming to Houston with Team Rubicon. Um, so, so much so where uh, she was working with our system, uh, with our lead system navigator, we found her housing, and she said, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm, I'm still serving here with, with, uh, through her, with, with Team Rubicon and her and Harvey. Um, so that's, you know, that's one story. But I, that, you know, again, I, I, I think it's important, you know, I, I realize we have to find a middle ground but I also think it's so important that we continually just beat down that door and, and, and let our communities know that veterans are its best assets. I love it. Um, I'm gonna say one thing, we've got 10 more minutes of us talking. If you've got a question, go to the app, they're piling up. Um, to make it easier for us, um, you can vote up a question. Uh, so if you go to the app and you, you see some of these questions folks are asking right now, click on that. I'm gonna use that system because there's a lot of questions. <laughs> so if you wanna hear an answer, vote that bad boy. <laughs> And, and it's a lot of cursing. But there's no cursing. I, I, I made that part up because um, I'm up here, so there's no cursing. Um, so flip that, flip that switch. Then, so let's talk about. I think we can close. And then, so 
what's the number one key to success? You know, actually, especially, I mean, you've got such, what's well, kind of cool, you've got to have this arc, right? 16, you know, you're, I mean, so what have you found with your organization? What's that key to success? Patience. Okay. I'm just going to tell you straight up, and I'm not known for it, but I, no, I, 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 uh, I, I had to, mm -hmm. I had to exercise a great deal of patience out of recognition that what we're trying to receive, what we're trying to do is in the hands of others. Okay. Uh, we, this is not something we're driving, you know, from upstate New York. What, what we're actually careful not to do is to oversteer in any direction and to exercise a great deal of patience. And you have to give yourself a longer term horizon to moving these systems of, of things that we're talking about. And I've had to exercise newfound patience in my partnerships to, to give them the room, to make the mistakes, to underwrite those mistakes, to, to patiently coach in a very sensitive way progress forward. So very, for me, it's been exercising patience is the key to this. And, and that goes against what people would like you to do. They want you to drive fast and expand this. And, yeah. and I remember talking to a guy, and, and he was like, you should be doing this in 100 communities. And I'm like, yeah, right. Good, good for you. you know, yeah. It's it just so. You, what we're all trying to do is to kind of optimize what's out there for people. It, it exists, but we're just trying to retool it a little bit. And the way we do it is investments in others. So you have to really exercise patience. Right. Okay. Yeah. For um, so one thing, hey, you know, for us, it's. Uh, <laughs> it, I, That's I, so easy, my friend. I'm not patient at all, and. Uh, <laughs>
as the glue rather than the umbrella, right? Or yeah. the, as the higher. So, um, so those those two things are really important, um, but also echo everything that everybody's up here. So I want to pivot at our, for our last the question that kind of pits on that. So. I know one of the challenges we often face in this program is that that last element they call the backbone, right? So it needs to be quick, I apologize, but I'm gonna skip you first, and I'm gonna go to car. <laughs> so when you pick that backbone support, and that could be an organization, or it could be a tool like Unitas, for example, what's the challenge there? How do you, how do you decide what's gonna be the backbone for a community, just in a nutshell? Have you, have you, how do you guys define that? What's the, what's the backbone for VCC? You know, I, I think in deciding that, again, we looked to our community okay. to kind of give us advice on that. So I think that's that's where I would, I just keep that answer simple, is okay. that we didn't come in with a solution and said this is the way it's got to be. Um, we said, what's working already? What's the most easy way we can build on what already exists? Okay. And let's do that. Jim Ray. Yeah, so our backbone is a, is a community leader, um, and it's a, it's a leader who, um, you know, we did the CBEP task force and they came up with some of these attributes which were fantastic and they really were, it's somebody who can bring people together, it's somebody who can communicate, somebody who can inform, someone who can, can be, right, and someone who can, who can uh, be objective and look uh, look across and have the, the focus that I'm here to serve veterans, not to serve me, right? Um, we use a tool for your serve, but it's not the backbone. The backbone is the person and the leader in the organization. The tool is for your serve that's the information system that sort of keeps track of the, keeps track of it. And then the last thing I would say is, um, uh, you know, in terms of going into a community for us, when we had the support of WWP, we went into communities with set measures, and we went to the communities and said, here's a framework, but if you want to switch it up, switch it up, but you have to meet these measures. These are the goals and objectives we're looking to achieve, which were collected in the community impact type areas. So, um, you, you know, I would, I would just say that. Kelly. Um, uh, ours are organizations within the community, right? And they sit between people in need and solutions across the community. Some are in the room, so we make investments in organizations that serve selflessly to address both the supply and demand side in these organizations. We call them coordination centers. Mm -hmm. there, we make investments in organizations between, they stack three to four people in there to kind of run a network in the community level, and they grow it. And so for us, it's that. In the early days, we went in search of it, and now right. we find organizations, we used to RFP it, now, um, those organizations and the leaders are, are actually emerging wanting to bolt that on to whatever they're doing. Some of them are large healthcare systems, others are like Blake Warren, I think he's in the room of Veterans Bridge Home in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, combined arms, our backbone yeah, organization. Yeah. yeah. Our backbone organization is actually combined arms, right? Yeah, right. It's, right. A, it's, a, it's a small, lean uh, organization that can be 100% focused on collaboration within the community and managing that system, right? Um, the, you know, we're built on, we do have the technology as well, which uh, is kind of a, enables our process. Um, but in the end, you know, our, when, when we talk about measurement, our, our organizations, you know, we facilitate um, conversations between organizations the organizations are their own leaders. They elect leaders of committees and then decide on measurements. Um, so while we facilitate all those discussions and group, the, the backbone, the ones who are actually making the decisions are the organizations themselves. Great.